Hey, hey, everybody. This is uh, Reverend Brian Blair. You're listening to Crossroads on WHUS 91.7 Stores. Uh, this is the show where we ask our guests each week to talk about the intersection of their everyday life and their faith life. And we've got a fantastic guest this week, uh, Dr. Professor, Professor Dr. Mark Healy, who is here at UConn. Hi, Mark. Hello. Glad you're here. How are you today? I'm excellent. Uh, as the phrase goes, long time listener, first time. <laughs> Wait a second. You know that phrase because you were a DJ? I do know that phrase because I was a DJ. And it's, it's fun to be here on WHUS. I spent several formative years of my life as a DJ <laughs> on WPRB, uh, which uh, was, is a uh, college radio station in New Jersey. Oh, wow. Not nearly as glamorous settings as here in the... Uh, palatial Husky Radio studio. This is great. <laughs> um, what do you like about this studio that's better than where you were? Well, windows, that's always good. Oh, windows are nice here. <laughs> I do appreciate that too. Uh, Mark, we're already into it, so why don't we continue? Um, why don't you tell our audience, if you don't mind, what you do? Sure. I am professor of Latin American history and chair of the history department here at UConn. And that's how I earn my bread, as the <laughs> phrase goes. Uh, we do a few other things along with that. Latin American history. Latin American history. How did you find yourself loving Latin American history so much that you'd like to profess it mm. at a university? Yes, how did I come to profess it? It's a good question. I, uh, I guess I, I had always been interested in history in various ways, but the particular connection had to do with growing up in Argentina. Mm. Uh, and then later returning to the U.S. and trying to make sense of that experience of being a North American who's been kind of remade as an Argentine, now remade as a North American. Uh, and also the, the kind of intensity of the time when we were in Argentina during the dictatorship uh, led me to be interested in, in history as a kind of, and, and literature, uh, as fields of inquiry. Um, along the way, I got a little distracted. Uh, what kind of distracted? Well, I, well, Can well, you say it on the radio? Yes, absolutely. All right. I <laughs> studied architecture and civil engineering as an undergrad. Oh, fantastic. With, you know, these other Latin American passions there in the background and connected and doing coursework and thinking about things uh, while I was trying to, you know, design better environments for people. Uh, and I discovered through three years of intense design studio that I found architecture in particular a fascinating way to look at the world, mm. an excellent analytic for understanding things and for posing questions, and also uh, a field for which I particularly was not <laughs> <laughs> exceptionally well suited. You, you really, to be a great architect, you really have to have. Uh, a sense of yourself as a form giver. You know, you've gone up on the mountain, you've seen the way that, you know, space needs to be shaped. You've mm. seen a vision for the future of our cities uh, or of our suburbs or of infrastructure. And maybe I've seen a few vision visions. Um, <laughs> but the visions that I shared and uh, committed to paper were perhaps not the ones that anyone w uh, wanted to live in. So. <laughs> Speaking of faith and revelations, years later, mm. after turning away from architecture to history and urban history, I uh, was in was back in Argentina doing research, uh, and one morning on my way to the archive, like a diligent little historian, I got out of bed and I took a slightly different path than I did usually to the subway. And on that slightly different path, a couple of blocks away from where I was living, I discovered on a corner a building which was the exact spitting image of my uh, third year studio project uh, in architecture design studio. It was the same. What do you mean? Well, uh, I'm, I'm, like, I'm not accusing anyone of, <laughs> of theft. I'm just saying I got to see, I had the rare gift of seeing a dream that I'd had, that I had decided not to pursue, mm. actually created in the world. That's fantastic. And it was a terrible building. And <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was blessed <laughs> to see what I had saved myself. And uh, you know, some, <laughs> unfortunately, someone else had had the same vision, right? But, um, but that was a great confirmation that I had followed the right path. It's nice sometimes to be able to say, that's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do it. 
Uh, so you didn't become a civil engineer, but uh, you were interested. And then, uh, but particularly, I'm asking uh, the whole idea of really caring about. Uh, did you say? Did you use the term Latin American? Yes. History. Yes, I did. So why? So you lived in Argentina. Yes. Came back to the United States. Mm -hmm. Maybe before we get into why you really wanted to pursue uh, what you've ultimately become, mm -hmm. you did have a phrase in there about adjusting. Yes. I think a lot of people would be curious about your experience adjusting. A lot of people have that experience when they move, especially back and forth to different countries. Mm -hmm. What was your experience of it? Well, I mean, on the one hand, you know, and certainly compared to the experiences of Latin American immigrants to the U.S. now, I had an exceptionally privileged uh, experience. We moved, my parents uh, were missionaries with mm. a group called the Navigators, and they worked for them, with them for about a decade. Uh, and the Navigators worked with college-age students, sometimes through colleges, sometimes through other things, um, across the U.S. and across the world. And so they'd done, uh, they'd worked at, at a couple different places in the U.S., uh, and then the, one of the people who was working with the navigators in, in Argentina needed to leave, and so uh, they were asked to replace this person, and so we moved to Argentina. And I was uh, nine years old, and I spoke essentially no Spanish, although uh, I did uh, learn the phrase, um, I did learn a phrase for it that I cannot speak Spanish, I, I, I do, that I don't speak any Spanish. Um, <laughs> And, and because that was the one phrase I had, I, of course, practiced it obsessively. So that sounded relatively <laughs> credible, which, you know, didn't help the thing. Because if you could say one thing well, mm -hmm. and the thing is, you know, I can't say anything mm -hmm. well, that doesn't make, people don't really know what to do with that. So we moved to Argentina, uh, and this was, um, wasn't the first time we lived overseas. I, I was born in Germany when my father was in the military, and we oh. lived in, in Germany as a child. How long were you in Germany? How old until you moved? Uh, until year zero to one, uh, and then <laughs> year kind of two to three and a half or something. Wait a like second, that. from Germany to Argentina? Yes. I've heard that before. Mm, yeah, but by way of <laughs> New York City, uh, mm. Long Island yeah, may, may have... Okay, all right. Long Island may have other sins to atone for. <laughs> oh, they do. But that particular one, <laughs> probably not so much. All right. Uh, so it, we moved, and I went through the experience of being an immigrant kid, of, mm. of not speaking the language, of being bullied, of being confused, of being, you know, feeling constantly out of place, of being isolated, uh, of discovering later on that the one kid in the class who uh, was friendly at all with me, um, partly that was he was also telling the kind of bullies, you know, secret mean things about me as a way uh, of trying to ingratiate himself with them. <laughs> So, you know, the, the kind of the full spectrum of isolation and frustration and what, what am I doing and what is this world and I don't really understand it, compounded by the fact that this was Argentina living under uh, a quite frightening military dictatorship. Now, just for the general audience out there who might not be familiar with Argentine history, yes. what years are we talking about and who's the dictator? So, we are talking, we arrived in 1977. Mm. Uh, Jorge Rafael Videla was the de facto president of a military government known as the Proceso de Reorganización Nacional, the process of national reorganization. Mm. Military governments love to give themselves <laughs> those dramatic names, uh, which had taken power in a coup uh, a year before, in <coughs> on March 24, 1976, and which was um, busily dedicating itself to a number of tasks in destroying the Argentine economy, um, but it's a process. It's a process. That was, that was a process <laughs> of destruction. Uh, also creating, uh, you know, this is, this is th they're certainly not the first government to have done this, but they're the ones who have the distinct honor of having brought the word, uh, the disappeared, mm. uh, as a mm -hmm. noun uh, into English uh, because of the massive repression and the tens of thousands of people that they uh, tortured uh, murdered and or disappeared. Mm -hmm. So I've arrived in this country. The country is really fascinating. I'm very interested in it. I don't speak the language. I don't really understand much of what's going on around me. And it's compounded by it's a particularly difficult moment to understand because the country is under this dictatorship. And so, you know, people aren't necessarily being completely forthright uh -huh. adults, right? And, and children, 
I mean, it isn't like people were running around talking about the military or anything, but um, you know, you you get a vibe. Yeah, um, yeah. The uh, I went to a bilingual school, and the uh, it was an English school theoretically. That there was an English headmaster who was kind of old, doddering English guy who wore tweed and smoked a pipe and kind of had spittle out of the side of his mouth and you know, sort of looked like. <laughs> <laughs> what you would expect. Is this what you aspire to? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a uh, sort of sub-director who was Argentine and who had a military haircut and who, you know, mm. was responsible for physical discipline and who, in whose office I spent a considerable amount of time. Oh. Uh, oh. Sometimes I tried to fight back, never successfully, um, at the bullying. Mm. So... As often, it's a story of kind of being broken down mm. uh, and then uh, finding kind of a, a different world and actually, you know, mastering Spanish, uh, just like Bart Simpson in his dreams ah. when he goes to France. <laughs> finding yourself dreaming in Spanish, finding yourself kind of connecting with this new reality and really having a different appreciation of who you were and where you were coming from. And then, of course, being becoming a super hyper patriot. And so there are, in my little childhood files kind of poems to how we need to reconquer Malvinas. Um, a long, somewhat mysterious patriotic epic, epic about penguins. Oh, well, you have to. I mean, all the way down there at the tip, right? <laughs> Who knows? We have Gentoo penguins down there. I yes, think. right. And, then that, and that kind of the final achievement being uh, when a few years later we left to return to the U.S., a teacher being surprised to say, but I thought that you, would, I thought you were Argentine. Mm. Um, well, good for you. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. I know that your wife is Spanish from Spain. She is. She's, she's Catalan even, yes. Y does she think that you <laughs> speak Spanish? Uh, she does. I, I, <laughs> okay, I mean, okay. so she's, uh, <laughs> Spanish is her second language. Catalan oh, is, her, wow. is her first oh, language. Oh, sure, right, right. So I've actually corrupted her Spanish. Oh, wow. Because I'm probably more committed to Spanish as a language than she mm. is. Right, right. Um, I mean, she mm. speaks it fluently. Well, do you speak Catalan? Have you? I do, I do. How far from what what maybe we'd call standard Spanish is it? Like Italian. Okay. I mean, it's it's yeah, oh, it's so related. It's, a it's similar. Yeah, it's a, it's sure. a, yeah, yes, very much. Wow, so. wow, wow. So. Uh, and they don't want you to make that mistake. Too. Well, right. So the <laughs> uh, I don't know how your Spanish is here, uh, but uh, or your Latin, but um, we might know. So there's a there's a famous. Uh, shibboleth, sort of a tongue twister, that the Catalans say to distinguish Catalan from Spanish. Mm. So if you'll indulge me for a moment. Please. This is unexpected crossroads Come content. On. This is, we're crossing the roads We're here. crossing the roads. Cross this, is, this is very far here from we go. a crossroads <laughs> in Mississippi. Um, <laughs> okay, so the phrase is, sets a jutjas the wound got, menjan fetja the panjak. Yeah, that's not Spanish. No, but it means uh, 16 judges uh, of a court eat the liver of a hanged man. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Sounds like a grim fairy tale. Yeah, it's a grim, yeah, exactly. Wow. In, in every sense. All right, well, your, anyway, your catalog is fantastic. <laughs> returning Enough to, the, to do that. <laughs> returning well, to how the about this? Part. How about this? You, uh, <laughs> you did a nice job sort of uh, interwoven, and you used a few phrases along the lines of um, adjusting, changing, yes. which is a spiritual thing. You mentioned that your parents were there because they were missionaries of a sort. How would you describe yourself then as a person of faith? And then I guess a follow-up question that might be fun for our listeners is, did you feel like your faith helped you through all those transitions? So uh, the the second question, I'll take the first. All right. Uh, <laughs> y absolutely. Uh, you know, which doesn't mean that one doesn't have also, you know, particularly if you're coming as a missionary kid, right? Your dark nights of the soul are, uh, you know, <laughs> are that on several dark. levels. Yeah. Um, but. No, it, that was that was enormously helpful uh, as a way of understanding, you know, this to be serving some larger purpose. I mean, uh, you know, I think that th our particular little adventure, um, the kind of community that we got connected with uh, of of the students that my parents worked with, um, you know, many of whom I continue to be friends with now, you know, even though I was a child at the time and they, you know, are 15, 20 years older than me, but. Mm. Uh, that that was yeah that that was a key part of my 
spiritual formation, certainly. Um, I mean, one of, the, one of the virtues of this particular ministry that my parents were uh, part of was because it was working with college age students, there were always kind of 20 year olds around the house and there was a lot of sort of informal activities and trips and different things and they would be babysitting me and my, my uh, younger brother and sister mm. um, before in the U.S. and also in Argentina and, and, and afterwards. So I always had this, you know, th th this had its danger, the danger that, you know, many kids have when they have lots of adults around and they get to be really good at talking to adults and not so good at talking to their peers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe there was a little bit of that. Uh, <laughs> but it, it also had a, a virtue of getting to kind of see people in their faith journey at different stages in their life and getting a sense of what that might look like for me, um, you know, later on in different ways. Uh, so that was that was key, and that was key to the, the this kind of larger process of adjustment, the kind of journey of from being an outsider to being not an insider, but someone who was kind of accepted in the society and understanding the society for its flaws, but also for its virtues, and even you know its penguins. <laughs> oh, the penguins! <laughs> well, you mentioned in that the idea of a journey and seeing what like life might be like as you move through a kind of spiritual journey where are you now how would you talk about your faith now well i mean i i am a committed believer and uh a follower of christ uh and yeah exploring how that how that works in our kind of changing context right and especially um at a moment in our national <laughs> journey uh, when those kinds of commitments are often weaponized one way or the other. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, that's tragic and frustrating and I think an anguishing conversation that we have, uh, you know, as a country. Um, and so that's that's been, you know, a, a concern over these last years, you know, for both for our country as a whole and also for, you know, what role I might play in, in producing a more... Uh, fruitful, um, supportive, civic conversation, um, including occasionally, you know, perhaps are adding as, you know, we academics like to think we do, our little prophetic voice on <laughs> things we should watch out for. Well, I, you know, I appreciate you being humble about that, but, you know, if you're going to talk about things broadly so that you can help people, not just individuals, but swaths of society, uh, move in a direction I think you should know what you're talking about. <laughs> so I appreciate people who really care about their subject area. I, I, w I hope that we all do uh, and I'm glad that you take it seriously. Before someone opens one's mouth one should have something to say. Uh, it's helpful I think. It's fun to have coffee talk right but if you're gonna get up there in the public square uh, I think it's important to have something to say. So I appreciate people in your position who've dedicated your life to making sure that you, you do your homework first. Part of that is not only research, but for a guy like you, also prayer. Yes. And then, and then let's say what we have to say, right? Yeah, it, it's an interesting, it, just speaking from the it's an, it's an I interesting and challenging moment i think for for lots of um, scholars uh, folks who are publicly engaged uh, both because there's a hunger i mean specifically for history because history has is kind of freighted with uh, well, lots of questions of meaning you know where where indeed do we come from what are we aiming for as a society what what does this what is a society built upon uh you know where what are sort of the the relationships the ideas the the particular practices the leaders uh the movements that have shaped our sense of right and wrong uh in our direction mm. so it, it's an interesting moment because on the one hand as a society there you look in the new york times or the washington post or you know conservative publications and there is a sort of constant uh appeal to history and lots of engagement by many different historians of, of differing political you know uh, beliefs and stances on the other hand uh there are also i mean there there is a a very uh democratic uh <laughs> You know, participation in the conversation by many folks who really have no idea what they're talking about. Mm. Um, 
and you know they have ab every right to speak up, but <laughs> they, they don't necessarily. They, they might do well to uh, sort of thoughtfully engage before uh, you know firmly holding ideas about the original meaning of the U.S. Constitution. Say, oh, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know those those sorts of or what you know what this country was founded on, or um, to you know the kind of great long-standing uh, topic of controversy and discomfort, the place of race in American life. Uh, so it, it's, it's both, a, it's an interesting moment when I think historians in particular and, and scholars are called to engage and to kind of return some of the public investment that if you work in a public university or you're part of public institutions has been made in your formation. Mm. Uh, the kind of community conversation that the, you know, the voices of the elders that you've drawn upon, the experience and so forth, to enrich and hopefully, you know, in some ways redirect our conversation. Uh, but the public doesn't always want to hear those things. Uh, and we are in a broader moment when the public, or at least the powers that be, are often defunding those things. Right? Mm. This is a, a moment of particularly intense uh, underfunding of history uh, and of other humanities at university levels. Not so much here at UConn, but other places and across the academy more general. Uh, and also, you know, as you know, I mean, of, of some intense controversies about in, in K-12 about education and, and what children should be taught and who should be doing that teaching and how it should be shaped and, and some you know, serious attacks on the autonomy and, and uh, integrity of public education. Well, you, you teach here, and you mention um, race and the issues we've had at a nation. What, what kinds of things would you say UConn is working on? I mean, it's a land-grant university, right? Well, right, so there's, there's, a, there's one very interesting thing uh, that's coming up uh, next week uh, connected with the Native American Cultural Programs uh, uh, unit here at UConn and an incipient Native American Indigenous Studies unit. Uh, what people don't fully appreciate, perhaps, about the term land grant in reference to public universities is that means that they were, under the terms of the 1862 Morrill Act, given land by the federal government to help support their activities and to sort of serve the larger public that was central to the mission of public universities. That land, so this is this takes place at the same time as the Homestead Act. Mm. So it's part of this kind of great giveaway of land by the federal government. And so it was a giveaway of land that the federal government um, had obtained from others. <laughs> you said the name of the act was the Moral Act? A moral Act, yes. M-O-R-A-L. M-O-R-R-I-L-L. -L. Oh, mor oh, I apologize. Thank you. Go ahead. Is the moral M O R E L would be a, an act related to I don't know mushrooms, right? Uh, <laughs> I thought it was M O R A L, uh, and yeah. I was going to say that's funny. Next, yes, exactly. alongside the Homestead <laughs> Act, which sounds so Little House on the Prairie. Well, indeed, that is that is <laughs> the world we're talking about. But <laughs> but the point is that uh, much of the land mm. that was used to fund land grant universities was taken from Native Americans uh, forcibly. Uh, and though, so this is this is a kind of key part of the bequest of these major public institutions that is built on dispossession and on violence and on brutality and on continuing dispossessions. And some of those things, you know, you can follow those tracks down to the present. So next week, uh, the uh, Dodd Human Rights Impact here at UConn, uh, working with Native American cultural programs, are doing a series of events uh, that are tracing the particular where the land came from uh, and what indigenous groups the land was taken from to uh, support Yukon. And this is as part of a kind of larger project of repair. Uh, with indi many indigenous groups have launched a campaign for land back, not just about this, but in general, right, about trying to regain uh, some of the land that was unjustly taken from indigenous groups. Uh, and this is part of that kind of broader conversation, you know, and it's a hard conversation. Um, but that's you know one of the things that we're we're supportive of uh, the person who you know the broader context of this obviously was shaped by Native American uh, activism, uh, but the person who really did the kind of grunt work of figuring out which land went to who and why uh, is a historian um, who now teaches at Cambridge University in the UK called Bobby Lee Robert Lee, mm. a name also freighted with history. <laughs> 
Uh, and so he'll be talking too here. Uh, it'll be an online event next week. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. And so next week, of course, being, what are we calling it? Well, yeah, Native American Week, because it, it is connected to October 12th, mm -hmm. um, it, which, you know, the, the holiday formerly known as Columbus Day, Indigenous Peoples Day. Right. Um, which, uh, you know, we, we can't obviously get completely out from under um, uh, Columbus and what Columbus has meant uh, in, you know, say, Washington, District of Columbia, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or yeah, other yeah, places, sure. or Columbia, Maryland, right <laughs> next door, uh, the Columbia River. Um, so, uh, but clearly, the way that Columbus has been celebrated has also uh, greatly overshadowed and contributed to the continued oppression of Native Americans. Yeah, the term whitewashed comes to my mind. <laughs> well, yes, although it wasn't, there wasn't a lot of, it, it, was, it was more of a, it was a rather bloodier process than that, but yes, right. Well, you, as a person of faith approaching all those kinds of questions and as a historian, uh, I mean, what are your feelings about those kinds of questions and issues? Well, I think they're hard questions. Uh, I think they're, they're often they, I mean, they, you know, as a person of faith, they lead to some hard questions about the role of the church, mm. uh, for one. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, we're, we're called as scholars, we're called as citizens, and we're also called as people of faith to reckon with what we have benefited from, including injustices that we have benefited from, uh, and to do, you know, the, the work of repair, um, including also the work of restitution. Mm. Uh, and I guess uh, on a basic level, that means kind of starting out with some humility to really carefully look at the evidence. Uh, and that often means having to look beyond some kind of um, just so stories that you've been told or understood about history um, and, and grapple with the evidence and try and uh, bring it into a new conversation. It also means to listen to other voices. Uh, you know, a lot of these, a lot of the these discoveries have been driven. You know, they're partly a story of kind of archival rediscoveries and historians and other scholars bringing new things to light, um, and they're also partly a story of activists and other communities uh, calling things out. I mean, the, the <laughs> I, I don't know if you followed. Uh, this is, you know, sort of slightly related. The um, this past week, there have been some discoveries about some much stronger evidence. Uh, of human habitation in the Americas long before the period of kind of 1300 years ago, which had been talked about as part of the uh, land bridge from uh, Oh yeah, the I just Springs. saw. Yeah. They're pretty much done with that as a theory, I they heard. They are done with that as a theory. So there are lots of interesting things to be said about that, but one of the most <laughs> interesting things is that uh, you know many indigenous activists and indigenous uh, ideas about origin have said that this was nonsense for a long time. Now, mm. obviously, those indigenous myths didn't say, yes, we really arrived in 1550, <laughs> you know, 15,500 BCE, right? They weren't, they, they were telling a story in a different way um, and with a different kind of precision. Well, if... Uh, but the question is just to listen to those voices, right? And I mean, I think that's something that's, something that's an important part of our faith journey as well. You use the word humility, and then you use the word listen. And, you know, I'm glad you're on the show, because one of the things I appreciate personally about history and historians is, ev f I'll just speak for myself, every time I start to think I know what I'm talking about, and then I actually do my homework, I realize I don't know what I'm talking about. And then learning more and more about the history of humankind uh, and realizing it's quite a history. Uh, brings me to a place of humility and going back to your earlier conversation about you know where we are as a nation I think we could all stop for a minute and take a little humble pill <laughs> and I think that would put us in a better place um, yeah. I'm glad you brought up the topic of humility it's certainly quite spiritual humility yeah there's a there's, there's a great uh, James Baldwin quote I'm gonna I'm gonna mangle it because I can't remember the exact language but the but the point is that American history is stranger, more terrible, and more wonderful than you can imagine. Um, and I think each piece of that is interesting to think about, right? That, that, there, that there are great things that you'll discover and also some awfulness that needs to be confronted. Which is quite a spiritual thing to do. Indeed.
Well, let's end with James Baldwin. Uh, everybody, you listen to WHUS 91.7 here on the campus of UConn. We had our wonderful <laughs> guest here, Professor Dr. Mark Healy. Thank you very much. Uh, everybody, have a wonderful rest of your day.